You're listening to Living Out Our Faith in a Fallen World, a series preached from the book of James by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. James 2 this morning. It's been a while since we've been in the text. It's been a few weeks now, so let me just quickly review this morning. Um, James has been talking to the church about their interaction with the Word. And what's already been said several times this morning is James challenges every one of us, not just to hear the Word, but to be doers of the Word. And then he gives this illustration, this example that we can all uh, relate with. He, He equates listening to the Word of God and not doing it like a man or a woman who looks at a mirror, sees their face, and walks away. He says, we see our face in the Word of God. It's a mirror for us. But then we flee, we walk away, and we soon forget what was exposed, what touched our hearts, what we feel we must change or add to our lives, and so then we fail. There is no compliance. And is it any wonder that we can grow up in churches and be there for years and never see real, substantial growth in our Christian life? We've walked away from the law of liberty and there's little fruit. A question that we, we might want to ask ourselves more often than not is, for every one of us, as we sit in church, as we leave, how are we doing spiritually? Not just checking off boxes, because I heard I was there, my attendance is great, but spiritually, is there fruit in our life? Because the Word of God and the Spirit of God is transforming us because we're not only hearing the Word, we're doing it. And so, my brother and sister this morning, do not be surprised when you look back over your life over the last year even, that there's very little change happening because you have been hearing, we have been hearing, we look at the mirror, we see it, we walk away, forget, there's no fruit. Instead, James says, we are to look at the perfect law of liberty, to stoop down, to stay, to remain, and then to start to do the work that he's called us to do. And that phrase, the law of liberty, will come up again. We find it in in chapter 1, verse 25. We'll see it again in chapter 2, verse 12 or 13. The law of liberty, a strange statement indeed. It's an oxymoron. is Is it restrictive or is it freedom? And the answer is yes. It is yes. This perfect law of liberty is restrictive. There is a way to live. For God's people, there is an instruction manual. We have a book. It has been given to us in grace so that we know how to find flourishing this life. Too many of us are living a life, our heads are being pounded against the wall over and over again because we've heard the word, we know the word, and somehow we think we don't have to do the word. The scripture is a grace to us. We know how we are called to live. It helps us grow in godliness. And it shows our Savior that we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so there is a restrictive element of this. We don't just do what we want to do. We look to the word and we live by the word. But at the same time, It is a way of liberty and freedom. Christian, this morning, we no longer have to be enslaved to our old patterns of life, our old attitudes, our old actions. We can be free. We can be delivered from our lust, our greed, our pride, our bitterness, our anger, and all of our addictions because we look to the perfect law of liberty. This morning, you and I can be free. There is no excuse. We no longer have to live the way we have been living as we look to the perfect law of liberty. And may I submit to you this morning that the ultimate freedom for every believer in Christ this morning is the freedom to truly love those around us, really love those around us, the way we were designed to live, This verse is not in our our notes this morning, but Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, 13, he says, we are called to liberty. 
But do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And I submit to you by the end of this message this morning, you will understand, I hope you'll understand, what it truly means to be free to love the way that we're supposed to. James chapter 2 this morning. And I have to, I have to warn you, I, I usually don't take um, 13 verses at a time. I'm really good at taking one at a time. But we're going to go through 13 verses this morning, and, and we're going to sort of work our way through. It's going to be exposition. Every verse we're going to talk about, I'm going to go quickly through that. Um, and at the end, the very end, I will make application. There'll be, it's one point. That's it. But as we go through quickly, I want you to think about what's being said in the text and not to think about outside there or anyone else, but to think this morning as we work our way through about in here, in this assembly, and even more than that, in here, in my own heart, in your own heart this morning. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren... And again, we, we've learned, I hope, he's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. He is addressing the entire church. He says, my brethren. And here, we find this phrase for the fourth time. The fourth time. And so, we can already detect, again, James's heart for his brothers and sisters in Christ. He, he recognizes we're a family and we see his love for the church. My brothers and my sisters in Christ. Listen now. Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. James says, my dear brother and sister, listen now, pay attention. Do not hold the idea, this state, condition, attitude, or action. Do not hold. And what I find fascinating about this first phrase, do not hold, it's a present active imperative verb. Verb, which means this. Number one, it's an imperative. James is not giving us this morning an idea that might be good for you sometime, some way to practice. He is telling us this is a command for every believer. Do not hold. Don't have the idea, the attitude, and we'll see in a moment, of partiality. But it's also present active, meaning it's continuing. James understands this is not just a one-off. He's going to deal with a problem that continually happens in the heart of every man, woman, and child in our world today. And so he says, my brother and sister, I love you, but do not and continue not to do this to practice partiality. To practice partiality. Partiality is an idiom. It literally means to accept the face to accept the face. No other requirements, just to look at somebody and either accept that person or to look at them and for no other reason than their face, reject that person. It means to make unjust distinctions between people by treating one person better than the other. Partiality. We might not use that word. Maybe we'd, we would use distinction. Maybe we would use favoritism. But you get the point. It's to look at somebody and to think, I will accept them or I will reject them based on what they look like or what they might be able to do for me or not do for me. And I will determine how I view you and how I treat you, and what you can do for me, and if I will even acknowledge your existence based on the acceptance of the face. And James says, my dear brother and sister, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. This has no place for you. And, and notice what it's based on. It's based on our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend this morning, remember this. The faith of the Christian this morning is based on a person. A person. 
This morning, you can, you can take Muhammad out of Islam and you can still practice Islam. You can do the same for Confucius and Buddha, but you cannot take Jesus Christ out of Christianity because when you do, you do, no long, you do, not, long, you do not have Christianity any longer. You know what I'm saying? Right? When he's out, you cannot separate the teachings of Jesus Christ with the person of Jesus Christ because he is not an ordinary person. A matter of fact, I would suggest to you this morning on our text, he's an extraordinary person. Notice what James says. He calls him the Lord. The Lord. The ruler, supernatural authority over mankind. The Lord. Jesus. What a beautiful name. Jesus. Savior. Savior. The one and only Savior. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But he goes on. The Lord Jesus Christ, Messiah, the King, the one who will rule and reign forever. This is who we're talking about this morning. This is this idea of you cannot do this because of the faith that you and I have in this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't stop there. Did you notice he says, the Lord of glory. And it's interesting, when you, when you look at that, um, in the original, it's, it's just the Lord Jesus Christ, the glory. The glory. And in that statement is the idea of what the Old Testament called the Shekinah glory of God. You will not find that word in the Bible. It's, it's not there. It's a word that was used by the rabbis in, in, in rabbinical literature to describe the presence of God with his people. That when, when the cloud came down and when it filled up the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord was there, and they would call that the Shekinah, meaning that God's very presence, the one whom men and women could not look upon, has showed up with his people. Moffat says this. When James writes this, he means to say that Jesus Christ is the full manifestation of the divine presence and majesty. When we say Jesus this morning, we are talking about the creator of the universe, the one and only. And please remember this. The person who penned these words, James, was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, which means he lived with him. He played games with him. They sat around the same table. Granted, it wasn't one of our tables, but the same table and ate meals together. He knew him like few others could, and yet he pens this statement after his death and resurrection to say, Jesus Christ is the full manifestation of the divine presence. And so James is reminding us of that to say, you cannot hold this one, your faith in him, and practice this idea of partiality, distinction, or favoritism. Let's continue. Verse 3. And so now James is going to give us this hypothetical situation. Like, just suppose. Here's what he says. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit at my footstool. And so here's a scenario. They're at the assembly. The church is gathered and two men walk in. Almost sounds like the beginning of a joke. And two men walk in. It's not a joke though. 
And the one walks in and he has fine apparel. He is filthy rich. It's obviously obvious. The word gold, um, gold rings on his finger, literally is translated gold fingered. And the idea was this. In, in their day, if you were wearing a, this is not gold, this is plastic. If you, if you were, I just want to say, this, this, they didn't do it, any of it. If you were wearing a gold ring, it meant you had wealth. And so it's gold-fingered that this man comes in and every finger has gold on it. He's flashing the bling, and it's to make a statement. I am distinct. I am wealthy. I am not like you. He's filthy, rich. He's gold-fingered, and not only that, he has good clothes. The idea of the apparel there, being fine, means bright, shiny, not soiled. This guy did not walk into church coming off third shift wearing his overalls. It's shiny white. Literally, the white of the toga that a politician would wear. So this guy walks in, and the entire assembly sees him. He's filthy rich. The second guy is not filthy rich. He has filthy clothes. And that's the only description we're given. Nothing else is said about the guy. We don't know his, his background. We don't know his work. We don't know his, his name. We don't know his character. But we do see he's got filthy clothes on. And so you say, as a church, to the rich, ah, you're a man of means. You're a man of status. You're a mover and a shaker. You could really help us here. We've got a building project. We have some real needs. It's the kind of man that you'd want to drop their name in a congregation. I know so-and-so. You come and sit here. This is the best seat we have. Front row. Remember that. Front row. Best seats we have. You come down and you sit here. And as he's doing that, the door opens again, and a guy in filthy clothes comes in, and we say, hey, can I help you? Are you lost? That church might be down the street. Oh, you're here to stay. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. There are some seats in the overflow. Or I do have some room on the floor if you want to sit by my feet. That would be acceptable. Look at verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This phrase literally means that as a congregation, they have just outed themselves. They have just made clear who their target group is. The first impression that both of these men receive as they walk through the doors of this assembly is, we treat people differently around here based solely on how they look and what we believe they can do for us. And he says, have you not become judges with evil thoughts? That word evil means, of course, bad, but worthless, sick, and diseased. The church has become evil judges. Their thought process is diseased. It is sick. It is worthless. And you might ask, ask, why would this be such evil thinking for the congregation? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you two reasons. Number one, that evil judging like that is contrary to our faith to our Christian faith. We as believers believe that every human being, 8 billion plus, every one of them have value, worth, and dignity because they are created in the image of God. Period. Period. 
It does not matter their daddy's name. It doesn't matter where they were born. It doesn't matter how much they have or do not have. It does not matter the color of their skin. None of it matters. You have dignity, value, and worth because you are created in the image of God. Of God. From the womb to the tomb, life has value. We have seen 27-week-old babies. Perfect. Perfect. Little eyes, little ears, little nose, little mouth, eyelashes, fingernails. 27 weeks. Value. It is life. It is life. People who talk about abortion have no idea what's happening in the womb. It is life. And from the womb to the tomb. We have a culture that wants to throw away our sick, our handicapped, and especially our elderly. Because now they're somehow useless eaters. That's our culture. We would just as soon put you down like an animal. C.S. Lewis, in his great work, The Weight of Glory, says this. Now listen. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Let that. No ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors that will spend an eternity in hell or everlasting splendors. There are no ordinary people. There is no one in this room this morning who is ordinary. No one. We are living souls. Destined for either hell or glory. That evil thought is contrary to our faith. And note number two, it is contrary to our founder. This is not the Jesus way. Jesus did not come with a target group. Look, look, at, look at that motley crew. <laughs> look at the men he chose and the women. Interesting. The women. In that group that followed him and supported his work, um, there was Joanna, who was wealthy, And Mary Magdalene, who was not. This is not the Jesus way. Jesus doesn't have a target group of people. A matter of fact, his open invitation is, come on to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. And when he, the Lord of glory, full of the manifestation of the divine presence, wrapped in humanity, walked our side. Do you know who he gravitated towards? The poor, the broken, the disillusioned, the outcast, the marginal, the untouchable. Those people, these people, this is our God. I'm afraid we have forgotten what we've been saved from. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me. In your sight. We've been saved. This is the Jesus way. Verses 5 through 7 now. Listen, my beloved brethren. And James is like, okay, this is James. And he loves these people. These are his people. Listen. 
he says. Basically, what are you thinking in this scenario? He says, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Uh, This is God's practice. God's practice. God's kingdom is an upside-down kingdom, my friend. From the Old to New Testament, in Jeremiah 9, 23, he says, Let not the, the rich man glory in his riches, the wise glory in their wisdom, the mighty glory in his might. Don't glory in that. Why? Because God's not impressed. Glory in the fact that you know him. And listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Those of us who think we've become somebody, like we've got good stock, we are believers, look at us. Here's what Paul says. Remember your calling, brothers, sisters. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen. Here's who he's chosen. The foolish the weak, the base, the lowly, the despised. Why does he do that? To confound this world. And so that no one will glory in their flesh. That's not God's practice. It's not. And it should be our personal experience that there's something about being poor that really does move us to God, that we become rich in faith. I know poverty is subjective, right? And and some people say, oh, we were so poor. And and what, what they mean by that is we only had four cars, right? It's like that, right? But some of us do remember, like, being poor. I don't know about you, but when we were poor, I'll save the gory details in the stories, but we were praying a lot more for everything, right? And knowing we had nothing, knowing we were broken, knowing if this doesn't come in, we're done. Rich in faith. Rich in faith. And, and we know that by experience. He says to them in verses 6 and 7, But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? And again, listen to what I'm saying. This is not a blanket statement against the rich because we've already talked about the blessings of riches and poverty. That's not what he's talking about here. But these people were trying to impress those outsiders who were abusing power and arresting them and throwing them in court and taking advantage of them because they showed up and they looked nice. He says, what are you thinking? Verse 8. If you really, I love how he says this, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. The royal law. What a great name. It is royal, first and foremost, it was given by a king. This royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. The king's name was Jesus. And he said, if you want to boil all of it down to two things in our lives, Christianity is not complicated. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The royal law. It was given by a king, and is the king of all laws. Love God. Love your neighbor. In the commentary, critical and explanatory, they say the great king, God, is love. His law is the royal law of love. And that law, like himself, reigns supreme. If you love your neighbor, you do well. You do well. Pastor Andrew read Romans 13.10 this morning. It just talks about that that loving your neighbor is the fulfilling of the law. Like every commandment is fulfilled when I love the way I'm supposed to love, and that's the freedom we're talking about. Let's move on. I, I want to get to the application. Um, verses 9 and 10. But if you show partiality, watch the two things that James says happened. When I have the attitude that I look at the face, I accept the face, I accept reject, I'm making judgment calls on people. When I do that, number one, you commit sin. It, it's not a light thing. When we do that, and I say when we do that, we commit sin. We have transgressed the God of heaven. And then he says, and you are convicted by the law as a transgressor. This law of love, you've blown it. Verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And I just wonder, in James's mind, 
about this, because adultery and murder are the two crimes you can commit against your neighbor that we see in their horrific, their violations. But I have to wonder if when he says murder here, he's thinking back to the Sermon on the Mountain saying, yeah, the way you treat the poor, you despise them, is the equivalent of murder. If you don't do the one but do the other, have you not become a transgressor of the whole law? Because if you offend in one point, you've broken the law. It's amazing how we do this. We are really adept at categorizing our sin. Um, You know, the thief can't stand the liar, and the adulterer can't stand the gossip. And somehow we justify ourselves in the midst. But James is saying, you can act as you keep the whole law. And and listen, I, I mostly, I mostly keep the whole law. It's like the princess bride, right? He's not dead, dead. He's mostly dead, right? We mostly keep this law. And James says, no, it's a chain. And when you break the chain, you have offended a holy God. So he continues. So speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So now, what I've just told you, this example, you've seen it. So now speak and do, knowing that this law of liberty, the restrictive and the freeing, the ultimate law of love, will be judged by. So, in our example, the poor guy comes saying, speak and do. Hey, we're glad that you're here. Good to see you. My name is so-and-so, and we love the fact that you're here. Come and sit by me this morning. Right? Speak and do. And then, finally, he says... Um, 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. And I won't spend time there, but the point is this. Forgiven people must forgive. I hope you understand that. And people who have been shown mercy must also show mercy. All right? So, now, application. And this is it. And I hope you've been listening. Our culture that we live in this morning, our culture, is certainly, certainly by name, anti-partiality, anti-distinction, anti-discrimination. We hear it all the time. We're anti-this. We speak of equity, diversity, inclusion. We're anti-racist. We feel the plight of all the oppressed. We are social justice warriors. And have you ever noticed that the folks who shout the loudest about all of the injustice, they get full of pride, and everyone else who's not shouting as loud as they are, are worthless? They practice in their own hearts and lives partiality. And James says this is a continual warning because it's within all of us. This idea of self-righteousness and this idea of being better than someone else And you're not as vocal about this as I am, therefore you must be a loser somehow. It's in every one of us. There's this innate sense that I will look and I will judge and I will compare. We all do it. All of us. This is not just everywhere out there. We're talking about in here. Now, I've never done this, but maybe you have. Maybe sometime you've been driving your car and there was someone driving slowly in front of you. And, and as you're, you finally had enough, and as you go to pass them, you just always look at the person. What type of person is driving this car? And again, I have never done this. But when you look over at the window, are your first words, oh, I knew it was a woman. Who said woman? I didn't, he said that. I think he did. I didn't say it. As simple as that is, my wife said, Rick, don't use that illustration. I'll buy lunch, right? <laughs> we do it. We, we, just, we just do it. We do it all the time. Think of how sick our society is and how sick we are at times. How, and let's, let's go talk about society. Let's just, let's just be honest. In this room, us, 
How do you treat people in, in customer service? How do you treat a waiter or a waitress? And I'm serious. Do you know the Sunday afternoon crowd is one of the worst crowds if you're a waiter or a waitress? Right? Because they're rude, they think you're their slave, and they leave miserable tips. But praise Jesus, you just walked out of church. You're a hypocrite. You have made a judgment to accept a face. Think of how many times our behavior changes dependent upon who we're talking to. If we think it's someone that can really benefit us, we fawn all over them. Oh, and we laugh at their stupid jokes that no one would laugh at except you and I because we want something out of them. And then for those that we don't want anything to do with, we just label them and we dehumanize them. And this is what our culture does, and we do it. You put a name on someone, you label them. Oh, you're, you're a compromiser, you're a liberal, you're a conservative, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're this or that. I don't have to look at you as a human being anymore because you're that label. James is speaking to the problem in here. in the assembly, in the church of Jesus Christ. I grew up in a very strict, rigid background as far as Christianity goes. And, and I have to say, this, I'm thankful for what I was taught and what I learned, and not to say that there weren't wonderful, godly people there. There were, and, and I learned wonderful things. But in this culture, and it's going to sound strange to many of you this morning, but in this culture that I was raised in, uh, the fact is, during those days in the 70s and 80s, if a woman was wearing pants, it was sinful, right? If a guy had hair over his ears or on his collar, there was something wrong in his life. God forbid he had a beard, right? Um, and you dare not show up in church without a tie on, ever, because it meant somehow, some way, that you were spiritually less than everyone else. And we believe that our tribe, our tribe, was the only one that had the truth. We were the only ones that got it all right. And everyone else were compromisers. And they were liberals. And they were whatever. And we were great. And some events, and I never bought into that. We, we, we never bought it. But we were there. We were in that cycle and circle. But an event changed me about 17 years ago. That, that really changed me forever. The church was small. None of this was here. It was a long hallway. And we had an event where groups of churches were coming in to help us, to invite people. We had a kids thing going on in the evenings and afternoons. We had services. And then Sunday was a big day. And a man who I, who I love, and he's gone now, but I loved, adored, who mentored me, was speaking that Sunday morning for this huge crowd that we're going to have. And by huge crowd, like 120 people, I, I think. I'll never forget that morning. Kim and I were so excited because we, people were pouring into the church. It was, it was unreal. And we were at the door making sure that we, gr- we were to greet every person who came in. And, and a car pulled in, and, and some girl who had some associate with our church invited her boyfriend. And when he pulled out of the car, the kid was six foot three, skinny as a... As a Bean pole, skinny kid, six foot three, with spiked hair. It was beautifully spiked hair. I mean, it went the whole, like, like, like a rooster. Like, honestly, he looked like he was seven foot tall. It was unreal. He walks out of the car. He has black fingernails, eyeliner on, and piercings all over. And so Kim and I made a beeline in the parking lot to meet that kid and to greet that kid and to say, we're so glad you're here. The church filled up. We're getting ready to start. And Kim and I were coming in, and there was a crowd of people here as people were getting seats. And the main speaker said to me, Rick, did you see that freak? And I said, yes, I did. And I'm praying get saved today. 
I'll never forget, Tim and I were sitting right here in the second row at the time, angry. Ah, oh, I can't tell you how angry I was that he said that and weeping, weeping. What have we become? And I knew this man. I knew his testimony. And, and again, a godly man. But that attitude. At 19, he was the freak. He was a drunk, homeless. He stunk, vile, and filthy. And he had forgotten, completely forgotten, that he was the freak. And we are the freaks. And we all need Jesus Christ. And when the church of Jesus Christ comes to the place where we practice partiality, that we make a judgment call on a faith, we are wicked. And it cannot happen here, ever here. The church of Jesus Christ must be the place where every culture, life, and walk, and work can come and sit at the table. Because that's why he came. It should be that the Israeli and the Palestinian can sit down together in Jesus Christ. It should be that the Indian and the Pakistani can sit together around the table. It should be that the Shia and the Sunni can sit together at this table. It should be that the Hutu and the Tutsi should sit together at this table. It should be that the British and the North Irish can come together in Jesus Christ. It should be even, listen to me, that the Dutch and the Frisian <laughs> can somehow make this work. The rich, the poor, the successful, the unsuccessful, the broken... And this is going to become more and more imperative for the church as a generation of kids are being lied to today. They're being lied to. They're being, they're being given up by their parents. They're being lied to by our politicians and our doctors, telling them that if you mutilate yourself, you will finally be happy. I'm telling you something. When this implodes, and it will, in years to come, we will have a generation of kids looking for answers, and they must be able to walk in here, in here, and find the love of Jesus Christ. And so, we cannot be the people who show partiality. We cannot just accept or reject by the face. It is incoherent with the Christ who died. And it starts here, right now, in our church. Whether they're filthy rich or they're filthy clothed, we will love them as Christ would. My brother and sister, let me remind you this morning, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. And when I get that, when I get that, how could I not show mercy to every living soul around me? Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your word. God, forgive us. In, in our hearts and minds, we can, as a man in our Bible study last week, just mentioned a group and said, Here's a, and, and our minds went all over the place. We do this. Lord, may we repent. May we see the glory of what we've been brought into, this Jesus who loved us welcomes with open arms those who will come, repent, and believe. And so, Father, please do work in our hearts and lives. Let us be vigilant and aware of our thinking process. Let us gauge in our own lives and minds who we gravitate toward and why and who we, who we are repelled by and why. God, may this always be a place where people know the risen Christ is alive and well, and we are practicing the royal law to love our neighbor as ourself. If there's any here today that don't know Jesus as their Savior, may this be the day that they would surrender and trust him. And for those of us who do, Lord, change us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about what you've just heard or are interested in the ministry of Maple City, 
please visit our website at maplecitybaptistchurch.com.